Hi everybody. We're going to do a read aloud today and this is a new book called The Village That Vanished. In this story today, when slaves threaten a small African village, a young girl, her mother and her grandmother use their wits, their courage, and their belief in the power of their ancestors to devise and carry out plans to disappear into the safety of the forest. Let's find out about this family. The village that vanished. Gather round, my people, gather round, and hear the voices of your ancestors in this tale of courage and sacrifice. Young Ab Keneally waited still as a bird in the tall reeds that grew near the water's edge. A butterfly fluttered close by, but Ab Keneally, whose Yao name means listen, did not stir. She was listening to her mother's prayer. Oh, my ancient ancestor spirits, oh my grandmothers, oh my fathers, sister spirits, hear me now in our need. I hear your ancestor voices singing in the grass, the trees, in the wind, the water. I need your magic. Do not deny me now. Lend me and my children the secrecy of the crocodile below your waters. Oh, my ancestor spirits, we need your magic now. Protect our village, keep us free. Abba Keneally watched as her mother ro rose to her feet. Her tall, strong body was silhouetted against the red ball of the setting sun. It sank swiftly behind the line of the trees. She threw flower offerings into the twisted stream that flowed into the dark forest behind. Then her mother, who was named Enjamili, meaning upstanding, turned, weir turned wearily home. Abba Keneally followed several yards behind, carefully placing her feet in her mother's footprints. She knew why Enjamili was praying so hard. They might have to leave their homeland, and soon the slavers were coming. These are violent men from the north, her mother had told her. They come riding in swiftly on horseback, shooting their long guns, capturing unarmed farmers as they go. And Abba Keneally had heard that sometimes they took Yao children too. But why do they pick on us? She had asked. We are strong people and hardworking. And Jamili had answered passionately. They want to sell our labor. Our people are put in chains and sold into slavery to foreign masters. It was known that if the slavers came, they would begin by capturing those out hunting alone or on guard far beyond the villages. Then they could enter the village itself and there would be no one to oppose them. So far, and Jamili had added, holding Abba Keneally close, our village has escaped because it is surrounded by forest, but the slavers will find it soon enough. What can we do now? Abba Keneally asked. Ah, I have a plan. If only the rest of our village would listen. Now Abba Keneally wished she knew how to pray like her mother to help give her strength and ideas that could save their village. When Abba Keneally and Njamil returned, the villagers had gathered together inside the circle of seven huts that made up Yao. A lookout, lookout had just brought the news that slavers had captured people from a nearby village. No one was left, he said, to warn Yao for Yao's young hunters and distant guards 
must have been captured as well. Ayo! One elder trembled. Our strong men gone and no one to defend us. What are we to do? The villagers cried. Looking about, Abba Keneally saw that they were all just women and children, boys and old men. It was just then, and Jamili spoke up. I have a plan. May I speak? I, the elder said, waving her on. She stepped forward tall and straight. We must retreat, disappear like smoke, she said with quiet force. What are you see saying, in Jamili? We are not magicians to disappear in a puff of smoke. Do not joke at such a time. I mean, we must go into the woods, and Jamili explained, destroying all traces of our village so that the slavers will not know we ever lived here. Then they will not follow us across the river, not even into the deep forest. And she ended firmly, we must live there until they pass. Then, Abakanili's grandmother, Chimwala, whose name means stone, and who had reminded, remained silent, spoke up. Yes, to protect our children, we must go swiftly and soon. And so it came about that all the families agreed to Enjamili's plan and prepared to leave. They would take only what they could wear and carry. But when the villagers came around to help Chawala, the oldest of the elders, she raised her voice once more. I am too slow and too old to leave my home. I will remain with my house and our ancestors. The slavers will not take me. Am I not too old and too mean? Is it not said the crocodile will not eat the old wrinkled snake? No amount of arguments would move Chimwala, for her nature was truly stone. Many tried to convince her, but all these warnings, at all these warnings, she cackled, I will tell them I'm a witch. They will be so afraid of my magic powers that they will leave this old woman alone. Yes, the villagers decided. It would happen like that. To the slavers, it would seem Old Chimwala was just a hermit living in a little hut deep in the forest. So the villagers were agreed. Then one puzzled person called out, in order to follow Najimli's plan, we must burn our village. But such a fire would burn Chimwala's hut down too. What will we do now? A sacred child asked. Hearing this, Njimili knew she had not spoken clearly before. We must disappear like smoke, but not like real smoke from fires. That would attract the slaves, slavers' attention from afar. But how then? The most anxious elder asked. I have thought of a way, and Jamili answered while smiling. Each family will have to take apart its own hut quickly, stick by stick, stone by stone, and bury it or scatter it in the woods. Many villagers gasped. <gasps> then one sensible woman suggested, we can still save some house poles to use as walking sticks. Then another said, or to use as tent sticks for our stay in the woods. Till only the hut of Chimwala remains, said the oldest man, clapping his hands for them to get to work. All of the women and strong young girls quickly packed up their great cooking pots, too heavy for the long trek in the woods, and filled them with the most precious things. They buried them. One day they would dig them up again. The old men and young boys took the huts apart stick by stick, stone by stone, until it was an empty space that once stood. Then everyone began to clear and rake the area, making it look as if the ground were tilled only for Chihuahua's, Chimwala's corn. 
Soon, it seemed Chimwala's hut had always stood alone like that, surrounded only by her vegetables and garden that grew some cornrows. The people stood back then, leaning on their hoes, their tears wetting the soil where their homes, where their homes had rested and the smell of freshly turned earth about them. But it was Abakanili and Enjamili's time to weep and say goodbye. Remaining firm, Chimwala embraced them each in turn saying, I will stay here with the ancestors and we will greet you together when you return. May that day be soon, whispered, whispered Abakanili and her mother, and Jamili bowing before Chimwala, they left her and joined the waiting villagers. Then the people of Yao walked away towards the forest, full of sorrow to be leaving the place where they had been born. Looking back, they saw old Chimwala in her doorway, sitting as still and as silent as a stone. Walking single file, the villagers traveled along the path that led to the distant forest. But the wide, quick running river blocked their way. We must cross this river to get into the deeper forest, spoke an elder. But how? They chattered all at once. We farmers do not swim. We do not have, we have no boats. The river here is too deep and the current too swift to cross. The tribe stood there, defeated by the river. But then the tallest children ran ahead along its shores, trying to find a narrow stretch of water where perhaps they could all cross in safety. Abba Keneally, being the swiftest, quickly outran the rest. She flew directly towards the place where she had been waiting during her mother's prayers. When she got there, Abba Keneally saw the river was narrower, but she could not tell whether it was shallow as well. She must test it, but how? She could not swim. It was then that Abba Keneally thought, are we not still in the same ancient woods where every living thing can be inhabited by a loving ancestor? She thought of her mother's prayer. How did it go? Hmm. Could she pray too? The words came flowing through her as she chanted softly. Oh, ancestor spirits. Oh, my mother. Oh, my father. Oh, my brother, sister spirits. Hear me now in our need. Do not deny me. I need your magic. Wasn't there a line about water? Ah, yes, Abba Keneally recalled it now. The secrecy of the crocodile below your waters. Oh, my ancestor spirits, we need your magic now. Abba Keneally stopped and listened carefully, hoping for some answer to her prayer. Then she began to feel a coolness upon her cheeks. She heard a stirring. Leaves trembled in the woods what seemed to be coming from within the forest around her. The surface of the river, whipped by the wind, was beginning to shape into little waves. They lapped up against the round stones that were appearing just above the water. Soon, a row of stones running all the way to the opposite side of the shore was revealed. Was a stone path really there? Or was it only Abba Keneally's dream? She was afraid it would sink and fall out of sight. Trying to be at least as brave as her grandmother, Abba Keneally put one bare foot on the slippery but solid stone. Then she put another foot upon the next and the next, more and more bravely until she was dancing across the river. When Abba Keneally reached the last stone, she called back, come, I have found it. There is a path across the water. By this time, the rest of the people had caught up only to see Abba Keneally standing upon the water. <gasps> Magic, 
they all exclaimed, even her mother. They were afraid Abacanelli would suddenly drop out of sight into the rushing waters and drown. See, Abacanelli laughed out loud. It is the stones beneath the water. They run all the way across. Then she danced her way back and forth and back and forth again. See, she repeated, repeated from the other shore. It is safe, come. The people gathered at the edge of the river, but they were too timid to trust themselves into the swirling waters. Lacking faith, they saw no stones. Seeing this, the ancestral spirits ceased blowing upon the waters. Were these their children? Then Enjamili, the upstanding, spoke up once again, scolding. Have we no shame at all? Are we too afraid to follow? Does it take the sacrifice of an old woman and the bravery of a small child to teach us how to behave? Let us go over now before our foolish fear loses both our tribe and our future. Saying so, Abakanili's mother put one foot into the water and then another, determined to find the stones because she believed in her daughter's courage. The ancestor spirits blew mightily, once more revealing to Enjamili each and every stone beneath the rippling water. Shamed by their own cowardice, the lack of their faith, the people began to follow one at a time. The old women lifting their skirts, the old men poking their staves before them, the children squealing and slipping from stone to stone until the entire population of the Yao had crossed. Then they all came to Abakanili in wonder. How did you find the path in the water? Like my mother before me, Abakanili answered, looking at Enjamili. I prayed to the ancestor spirits, and they showed me the way. Hearing this, her mother hugged her brave daughter. Once Abakanili and her people had left the river, they settled deep into the woods, quickly making simple shelter under the tree. For food, the women and small children scattered about, picking berries from bushes and nuts from trees. The old men and boys hunting, catching small animals and fish from streams. And so it went. They knew they would survive. But had Chimwala survived as well? The slavers did come to the village of Yao, or where it once stood, riding in, whooping and hollering, firing shots about to frighten all into submission. Suddenly they stopped in their tracks, mouths dropped open. They lowered their weapons, for they saw only the single hut surrounded by tall rows of corn and crops of beans and yams newly planted. Rushing up to the door where Chimwala sat calmly, shelling peas, the chief slaver demanded suspicious, suspiciously, how is it you can live in these woods alone? Chimwala answered with a fierce glint in her eye. I am a soothsayer. I search for scattered herbs within these woods. I use these for magic potions. But then the man pointed to the newly planted rose. If you live alone, what about these? They look freshly planted to me. Surely this must be is much more than you could plant alone. Calm as a stone, Chimwala answered. My distant kin used to come and plant it for me, but now they come no more. I can tend only to a few of these rows. Not quite convinced, the chief sent his men off the beaten path, path into the bushes. All about, just to be sure, there were no people hiding in the woods. Hours later, the exhausted trackers returned, reporting, there was no one anywhere to be found. We went all the way to the river. There's no evidence of boats near there, and there's no way anyone could cross to that other side. Angry at the loss of slaves, he might otherwise have captured. The chief gathered his men, saying, we have been wasting our time here. There is nothing for us in these woods, and there never was. 
They rode off on their horses, making great clattering noises with their hooves, never to be seen in Yao again. And Chimwala, sitting in her doorway, watched them go, with a faint smile etched on her stony face. And that, my children, is how the Yao tribe was saved. And this story came to us many generations later. Because an old, old woman and a very young girl did what needed to be done when their people were threatened. They knew that once their ancestors had spoken, one must answer not only with faith, but with courage as well. The end.